Okay, folks, let's go down here and see Abijah Johnson's 1885 to 1910 doctor's office. And uh, how are you folks liking it so far? Okay, great. And um, talk about this and go down in the waiting room in a few minutes. You might have to spread out. I've got a pretty big group here. Abijah Johnson was a doctor in Montrose in 1885 to 1910. And in 1902, he brought the first woman doctor to Western Colorado, Harriet Collins. She stuck around for about six months and then started her own business and uh, brought the first x-ray unit to Western Colorado. I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. These, these two items, the exam table and this revolving cabinet with a desk in the front and it revolves around date to the uh, early 1890s. And when I got these items in Valparaiso, they were stored in an old Masonic Hall because when the doctor retired in 1933, uh, the, um, the doctor left the equipment in there. And so the man that owned the building didn't know what to do with it. And he was a Mason and he put it in the Masonic Hall where there was room to store it. And these, by the way, these items were in, in this cabinet. These actual items right here were still in this cabinet. So talking a little bit about this, by the way, is anybody, uh, it doesn't look like it, but anybody need a, uh, we just got a fresh supply of glass eyes in. And uh, so if we want to, uh, I, I need a little, a little practice. So, you know, I might want to do a little surgery. Uh, son, uh, um, this is an amputation saw from the Civil War. Uh, right back there, and the digit saw for fingers and toes. We could try it. You want to? No? Okay, well, I tried. This is a tree pan drill to drill through the skull for stroke victims to get fluids on the brain. And the Inca Indians in the 1500s uh, used obsidian knives to, to cut in to relieve the pressure uh, around the water around the brain. The, uh, the skull here. Doctors, pharmacists, and dentists had to purchase skulls in medical school, pharmacy school, etc., unless they were provided by the lab. This one was purchased in 1899 by a Harvard student who was studying to be a, uh, a pharmacologist. And uh, so they came from India, and until recently the skulls were still coming and, and skeletal material from India, but then people started um, killing people to make money by selling skeletal material and skulls. So they don't come from there anymore. And professors like you to have the real ones because they're much more intricate and, and detailed to study. The foot I got in a box of carburetors that, uh, that uh, I was restoring antique cars at the time and this articulated foot was, it was in there. So anyway, um, notice the, the um, griffins carved on the corner. Very intricate, uh, neat, uh, exam table there's the extension for it where is it there it is over there that extends it out for full full length now we're going to go down into the waiting room and uh, so it's a little tighter than in here so let's let's move on down that way so come on down uh, spread out a little bit in here now the patients this is the, like the waiting room and, and these doctors offices historically were often in a home and uh, like this one and so the patient would come in the door over here, the curtains would be drawn and the doctor would be doing a procedure in there. But he might step in, he might uh, uh, come on down and say, well, here, have a cookie and, uh, and I'll play a little music, which drowns out the, the noise coming from the scalpel or whatever else is going on in there. And uh, that's why the curtains are, are, are drawn. So anyway, so I'll play a little bit of the music he might have played. This is a Edison phonograph. Um, around 1904. It's my iPhone. Okay, we don't want to wear it out. The clock up here is 1840s and it's a one day clock. We wind our clocks on Fridays. But this one we have to wind every day 
it's a one day clock with weights. The carpet here is 1860, exactly 1860, was in an early home in Utah, Mormon home in Utah that we lived in. And this was the, uh, uh, a remodel in 1860. The house was built in 1851. And this carpet was upstairs in that remodel. And this is a piece, piece of that. So I let people play the organ. Um, But so, um, when I was eight and nine, I had my first museum when I was eight, but when I was uh, nine, 10, whatever in there, I had already read my dad's textbooks. He was studying to be a paleontologist, a fossil expert at the University of Nebraska. And uh, he had to drop out due to the, due to the depression. But uh, you had to have a geology background before, before, uh, before you could go into uh, um, paleontology. Well, then when I was 12, I visited Mesa Verde, and that's it, I'm going to be an archaeologist, which was my, my profession, or is my profession. And so, anyway, I got back to Nebraska from visiting Mesa Verde, and I read in the newspaper where this man lived in a chicken coop, immaculate, longer than this, but narrower than this, and he had a big Indian relic collection. He had been Buffalo Bill's horse trainer who had a dog act in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. He had a skeleton laid out on the far wall over here. Uh, with a, a arrow point, a projectile point in the spine, and he had a narrow uh, couch about this wide that he slept on on the other side. But it was an immaculate one, and I got my folks to take uh, take me there and visit him. We became good friends, and he even offered me that collection, which I couldn't afford to buy at the time, and it's in the museum in Nebraska today. Well, anyway, when I got my driver's license, I'd go pick him up, and we'd go out to the farms to, to hunt arrowheads. And we went out to the farm, this farm to get, ask permission, and I saw the, the pigs um, going to the bathroom on, on the, uh, in the pig pen on this horn, and I asked if I could have it, and they said, sure, they were kicking it around, and I went and put it in my car, and Bill Fowler, that was this man's name, disappeared, and I finally saw him laying down in the end of the corn row, laying down on the ground, and I thought the worst, he was a very old man. He had been Buffalo Bill's horse trainer who had a dog act in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. So I ran down there and he looked up, up at me and he had tears running down his eyes. And uh, the grave was all groomed, all weeded. And it turns out he'd walk out once a month and weed that grave and, and go back 15 miles back to his chicken coop, probably off of other fields and stuff to hunt arrowheads. And uh, I knew he hadn't and never married. And uh, anyway, uh, it was his lead dog from what he called Bill's show. And I said, what was Buffalo Bill like? Well, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was unkept. He was uncouth. He was disheveled. And about the point I said that on a tour, there was a lady standing here, and she said, excuse me, I happen to be William um, F. Cody's grandniece. Yeah, you could hear a pin drop. I knew I'd stuck my foot in my mouth now. She said, you're absolutely right. And she said, after 1900, and of course, I, I gave sigh of relief, and... Uh, Anyway, um, she said after 1900, he took to the bottle heavy, he wanted a divorce, he invested in gold and silver mines in Arizona and went broke. He sold his Wild West show in 1914 and died in 1917, as you know, in Denver. So anyway, um, uh, the, the uh, lantern here I made out of pieces, part uh, uh, out of an outhouse hole. I've dug several... Uh, dozens of outhouses for the treasures that have fallen down into them. Of course, they're, they've been long, long buried. And so, but anyway, the top piece out there, I dug out of an outhouse toilet hole. A lady would have a hard time lighting that without a ladder. But if you study it, it's got a chain that goes down and hooks over there. And you can release that chain and put it in another link up above and get it down here where you can, where you can actually light it. That was common practice to, in those high ceilings back in the old days. So, I think we ought to be moving along.